Welcome to Going Underground, I'm Afshin Ratansi. Coming up in the show, a resignation at the heart of Vince Cable's Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. We speak to Tessa Munt, who this week resigned from the government over fracking. And in the nine days since taking the throne, new Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz has overseen the beheading of more people than ISIS in the same period. Could he be the last king of oil-rich Saudi Arabia? Plus, Londoners march today all over the capital to protest against soaring rents, homelessness and the looming housing crisis. All this and more on today's Going Underground. Syriza's victory in Greece is last week's news, with or without a bailout from China to secure its finances. Today, mass protests rage across Spain against the neoliberal troika of the IMF, the European Central Bank and the EU. Pollsters say the next Marxist party to win will be in Spain, Europe's fifth largest economy. After Podemos takes Madrid in December, it will be onwards, to Rome maybe. But if Spain and Italy follow Greece, what will Washington do? Last time Marxism spread across the continent, the USA did everything it could, from false flag attacks in Italy to backing Greek colonels to destroy the democratic movements sweeping post-war Europe. Mass media will be one powerful tool at Washington's disposal. Look at this on CNN after the victory of Syriza in Greece. There's been a lot of attention on this guy caught in Greece. Yes, CNN is talking about a terror suspect caught in Greece. The new Greek government has plenty of challenges ahead of it. A towering debt, chronic unemployment and relations with the rest of Europe. But it also has an urgent security problem. Greece has become an unwitting crossroads, both for jihadists trying to reach Iraq and Syria from Europe and for fighters returning home from the Middle East. Yes, forget that Washington and London have been supporting jihadists in Iraq and Syria for years. It's Athens that has the problem. Soon it'll be Madrid's and Rome's. Any place that doesn't bow down to the IMF, maybe. If Britain ever votes for an anti-austerity party, we will no doubt have to be targeted for becoming an unwitting crossroads for the jihadists of the Middle East. The bid to put a freeze on fracking was outvoted this week in Parliament by a majority of 308 to 52. The controversial shale drilling process has faced massive opposition from MPs and communities because of the impact on climate change. But David Cameron says Britain should go all out for shale. On Tuesday night, one of the opposing 52, Tessa Munt, Liberal Democrat MP for Wells in Somerset, resigned from her position as parliamentary aide to Business Secretary Vince Cable. She joins me now. Welcome, Tessa, to uh, Going much. Underground. So why did you resign? I resign because my position is clearly not compatible with the government's line on, on fracking. And um, having objected, I explained that I was going to continue to object to the process of fracking. And that's not compatible, so I did the right thing and resigned. And Vince Cables and Nick Clegg, they both agree with fracking. I don't know what their views are on the party policy, which is made by our members, is that we are in favour of fracking. Um, I disagree with my party policy on this, and you know I can't make any apology for that. That's the way it is. I just think it's totally inappropriate for my part of the world. Do you think Vince Cable is coming under a lot of pressure from fossil fuel, the fossil fuel lobby, as it were? I mean, is that? No, how... I don't think so. I think actually you'll find that the reality is that um, the Conservatives have said they've gone all out for fracking. My understanding is I read some some of the newspapers saying that there'd been a letter gone out to um, a number of ministers and to people within the government, um, I didn't have one I have to say, um, saying that people should really work hard to make sure that Quadrilla and the companies who are doing this investigations work, um, they should be supported in some way and that fracking should be brought into, into play. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's where we stand pretty much. Because some voters yeah, might well, think, well, is... you know, we saw David Cameron obviously with the Huskies saying he's with, with green credentials. Liberal Democrats often, before, certainly before the election, before the coalition government, green credentials. Isn't this just yet another, uh, well, yeah, there's, it's a green, green coloured yes. emblem. Yes, absolutely. So, um, but I'm going to have to say, you know, the, you think the if Labour voters party, will say, why are the Lib Dems, well, the Labour Party will be crowing they, well, about it, it was Labour their party, amendments. They can crow about it, but they actually made a right horlicks of the whole thing on, on uh, Monday night because, frankly, they, they called the wrong amendment something that was going to be dealt with in devolution anyway. So they asked us all to go and vote on an amendment that was to do with Scotland completely pointless and that took away the ability of the House to be able to have time to discuss the trespass business which is actually 
that's it is on that particular amend uh, that particular clause. Let's get on to that in a, se in a second. Yeah, but that's the thing that hangs. Uh, that's how the fracking debate came into Monday at all. It's only about the, fr the trespass clause. OK, but on, cl on climate, change, climate change more broadly... It's absolutely... The Tories are for fracking. The Liberal Democrats, yeah. uh, your leader, Vince Cable, the business yes. secretary, he's for it. The Labour Party, two big unions that support it, Unite yes. and GMB, seem to be for yes. fracking. So there is a broad one consensus. It doesn't one's own. And, you know, I've tried over the last three years as PPS to Vince to make sure that I had access to people and try to change people's minds and to make them understand this is not the process that's being described. You'll find all sorts of people in the House of Commons saying, look, don't worry, this has been going on for 30, 40 years. It's completely different. This is, I've done my research. My understanding is that this process was first started in 2008 in the U USA. The one time it's been done in the UK was when we had the incidents of minor earthquakes up near Blackpool. Um, this is a different process. It's high volume hydraulic fracturing. It's a new process. No one can tell me this has been tested and it's been executed in, in the past and we've been doing it for 40 years. This is utter tosh. So, you know, we've, we've really got to make sure that we, we close down and I, am, I cannot and could not support the government. That's why I voted for a moratorium and I'd hope to be able to vote for the other aspects. And I understand you have new information or information that may not be widely available because Lord Brown, the boss of Quadrilla, came on this program and said that drilling was legally uh, okay under people's homes without their permission. Nice for him. But I, well, I understand that uh, well, this I has actually, implications yes. for lots I of people. I would take great exception to that because the, the, where we are now, now that the, you know, the Conservatives and the Labour Party have actually pushed this bill through, the Labour, Labour lot by actually abstaining and not, not calling a vote at the very end of it anyway, and not allowing trespass to be discussed, we now are in a situation where this bill allows for people's houses, farms, land, gardens, whatever, to be um, fracked underneath. So this, you can have horizontal access to people's land at, at deep level. Now, the difficulty is, I discovered at the end of last week that actually one of the biggest insurers in my neck of the woods, which is NFU Mutual, that's the National Farmers Union, their insurance policy has an exclusion for anything that is caused as an impact of fracking. Now, that is a new clause, and that is incredibly dangerous because, in my view, you have tenant farmers, you've got farmers, people who've got gardens, people who use the land for all sorts of purposes, anyone who's got a house on land. Um, if you can't insure yourself against something that the government says is going to happen without your permission, how on earth do you protect yourself? You know, homes and businesses are not going to have the protection. And once this one company's done this, and if you, I'm, I'm trying to find out whether the other insurance companies have taken the same view, but they've clearly assessed the risk. And in my area, you know, water is so important. Everybody knows about water in Somerset now, particularly as a result of the flooding, which took place in a relatively small geographical location, but with a massive impact on people's homes and lives last year and the year before. Now, if we've got a situation where water might be contaminated, then that is hugely risky for people who have animals on the land, who have crops on the land, who are market gardening on the land. And people need to be able to, it's just not fair to find that someone else can decree that something's going on underneath your land and you cannot protect yourself from the impacts of that action. This is, you know, we're used to insurances being around the idea of um, acts of God. This is an act of man and we should be able to allow people some protection. They've nothing now. And lots, and lots of money, but those arguments weren't enough to sway your Liberal Democrats I didn't have a chance to colleagues. give them. I didn't have a chance to give them because of the way that the Labour Party called the various discussion of clauses and the votes, there was no opportunity for us to discuss in full the aspects of trespass and the appalling things that... Well, I thought the happen. parliamentary fight was the fact that your colleagues were saying, actually, lots of these Labour amendments were in the bill. These protections are already... There are in. some improvements. And, part, I, you know, I was part of the, the, the process of, you know, I can see that I was going to be in a minority and I wouldn't be able to stop the bill. I didn't have the opportunity to try. 
but I wouldn't be able to stop the bill. You know, if you look at the numbers, you've got the Labour Party in favour, as you say, when GMB and Unite came winging in, and you've got the Conservative Party with Mr Osborne writing to people saying, look, go for it. The numbers are just too big. So who, who, there were only 52 of us in the end who actually went for the moratorium. There might have been more who would have voted to, to against the bill. I don't know. We didn't have the opportunity to say that. But the fact is, we actually need to make sure that... Um, well, your leader thanked you and just said... I mean, that was the comment from the that's government. That's my work, I think, over over the last three but the, years. But the comment was there were safeguards. You just don't think the safeguards I don't think under are. current legislation no, absolutely. are I mean, enough. I disagree with it on the grounds of climate change, full stop. But since it's going to go forward, I negotiated as strongly as a, as a number of my other colleagues, I think there were 13 or 14, 14 of us, who were actually were negotiating for better regulation, better rules around all of this. But in the long run, if you're going to be beaten, you may as well try and improve what's left. There's no point in just throwing your toys out of the pram. So went for an improvement. We got that improvement. They accepted the Labour amendment um, because it does bring in some extra. It's, it's not worded the way I would want it, but I didn't have the choice about that. But Vince but it Cable, you was just not interested. I mean, did but you always know he was pro-fracking? I don't think he is necessarily pro-fracking. I, I, it's something you'd have to ask him about, but I don't, I'm not sure that you would say. I think the party policy and government policy is to be in favour of fracking. And I can understand some of the nuances about this, because if clearly we want to get rid of coal, and gas is better than coal, um, but in the long run, this is fossil fuels, and it, for me, that's a complete... But did you get issue. pressure from fossil fuel companies when you showed opposition to uh, the government's pro No, I haven't, um, but I have to say, I did take the trouble last year, this time last year, to go up to um, a site in... in that's just outside Manchester, and have a look for myself and to try and listen and understand the arguments. Um, it raised a lot of questions. Do you get no letters, invitations from Quadrilla, reception parties? Not that I'm aware of, parties. no. I mean, maybe I have, uh, but I suspect my officers dealt with them in the way that they would anticipate I would uh, deal with it myself. Um, I'm because David Cameron has been close to the, uh, the fracking You'll community. You'll have to ask Mr Cameron about well, we know that. You know. Lobbying with the Chancellor as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. That didn't happen to the business department. Not as far as, far as I'm aware, but that is something you would have to ask Vince. I, but I certainly i am not aware of ever having been invited to any sort of pro-fracking sponsored events. But as I say, I have been a guest of Ineos, the company. They were generous. They gave me... Um, my sandwich lunch after and, and a uniform. Owners of the biggest to, refinery yes. in Britain. Yes, but you know, I went to look because I think it's not fair to be critical if you don't have some knowledge. And, you know, I'd gathered up a lot of information. I've met Ineos in Parliament, their representatives, and they were really helpful very early on to explain to me the difference between the American situation and ours. But you just didn't believe them? I in the end. didn't believe them, no. I mean, there's a lot of evidence. I've listened to um, geologists in my local area. And we should protect what is a fantastic landscape and a beautiful environment. And once you spoil these things, you can never really get them back again. That's why it's so important for my area, and that's why I'm so opposed to it. Tessa Munt, thank you. Thank you. Coming up after the break... Will rising instability within the House of Saud cause a political earthquake across the whole Middle East? Listen more in part two of Going Underground. If journalism is about speaking truth to power, there is no worse insult for a journalist than being complimented by those in power. Here's the Prime Minister this week. One of the most respected political journalists in Britain, Nick Robinson, the political editor of the BBC, said this. And I'm going to quote it however long it takes, Mr Speaker. A phrase the Labour leader uses in private is that he wants to, and I quote, weaponize the NHS for politics. Now, that is one of the most respected journalists in our country. Will he now get to that dispatch box and apologize for this appalling remark? Not that again. Ed Miliband could have just said he won't apologize because he actually wants to weaponize the NHS because he doesn't like the way it's been run by the coalition. But he didn't. This is a ridiculous smokescreen from a Prime Minister running from his record on the NHS. But one Liberal Democrat seemed to wonder whether Labour was using a smokescreen. It is now quite clear 
the decision by the last government to put Hinchingbrook Hospital out to tender, yeah. with the last three bids under them all being led by the yeah. private sector, yeah. was deeply flawed and has been a massive failure. Does the Prime Minister accept that this experiment in privatisation has failed? The PM rounded on Labour again. And it's no good honourable members opposite shouting about privatisation. It was their decision to allow this hospital to be run by the private sector. Labour and privatisation, poor Ed Miliband. It was left to Dennis Skinner to put the case against City of London caused mass austerity a little better. Why is it that we've got a record number of people queuing up for food banks. Will he apologise to them? Will he apologise to those that are on payday loans, struggling to pay them back? Will he apologise to those on zero-hour contracts? Another record number. The truth is, this Prime Minister has got a longer record than his mate Andy Coulson. That's Murdoch's Coulson, who went to jail, whom Cameron hired. You'll remember that. As David Cameron and other world leaders gathered in Riyadh around new King Salman bin Abdulaziz last weekend, the plight of Saudi blogger Raif Badawi, whose thousand-ash sentence has been the cause of global outrage, was roundly ignored. But why are the leaders of the so-called free world cozying up to a totalitarian regime which bans free speech, freedom of religion, homosexuality and women drivers, even when not carrying out public executions? David Hurst is the editor of Middle East Eye, and he joins me now. Welcome, David, to Going Underground. First of all, is it simplistic to say that uh, Cameron ignoring all the human rights abuses is down to the energy resources of Saudi Arabia? Well, I mean, uh, it, it, it's a well-tried British policy. You remember what Blair uh, went through? They're, they're, they are flogging um, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, as many airplanes as they can. Uh, same thing happened with Thatcher. Exactly the same thing happened with uh, Blair. So this is a well-tried policy. Uh, the difference today is that Saudi Arabia are uh, the, the, the boots on the other foot, basically, that Saudi Arabia are not beholden to Britain. Uh, it's the other way around. Uh, and Britain is desperately trying to keep a toehold in with, 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 with the new regime. Now, you're a veteran journalist. You were on The Guardian for years. Middle East Eye uh, gives sometimes a very different perspective over these things. And what we heard in the mainstream here was how wonderful it was that it was such a smooth transition of power uh, on the death of King Abdullah. Your article begged to differ, I think. Yeah, it's anything but smooth. There was a big power struggle going on uh, before uh, when Salma was crown prince. In fact, there were Egyptian anchors used, TV anchors used to discredit Salman and, uh, and, 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 and have his position as the crown prince annulled. On, this would be because Egyptian television has influences from, from Riyadh and from King Abdullah's well, old guard. Well, we know from leaked uh, conversations that they actually take orders. These anchors take orders from Sisi's private office, and, and the connection is with uh, Khalid Tawajiri, who was the sort of king, uh, who was the sort of mad gatekeeper, basically, of Abdulaziz. And Tawajiri was in touch with Sisi's office, and they basically said, could you put this story out, discrediting Salman? This is one of the reasons why one of the first people to go in the very, very quick reshuffle that we saw, so quick that all this happened before even the body was buried of the king. Uh, was that Tuejiri was out because he had been plotting against Salman. So is his moving about of cabinet positions that should have maybe surprised people in the foreign office here in London? Yes, I think they were surprised. I think they're perennially surprised by, by what happens <laughs> because I don't really think Britain has a foreign policy worth the word of policy. Uh, it sits and waits um, uh, and, and hopes it gets in with the right people. Now, everyone is clambering behind... Uh, uh, the, the new deputy crown prince, who, who is Mohammed bin Nayef. Uh, but before, very close to Washington, very close to London? Possibly both. Uh, when uh, Abdullah died, bin Nayef was actually in London uh, attending a counterterrorism uh, conference. And uh, his credentials in Washington were paved by a really important visit in December last year, when he was literally, the, the, the doors of Washington were thrown open to him. So definitely, they made a great play for him. Who is more pro-ISIS and who is more pro-Al-Qaeda within elements of this uh, big royal family? They're all dead scared of ISIS, right? Uh, the question is their reaction to it. And they're also all hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood, i.e. they're hostile all to not only political democratic Islam, but also uh, militant Islam as but well. But where were the elements of the Saudi Arabian family that were 
we hear, allied to uh, groups that uh, well, uh, are crypto ISIS or uh, supporting uh, them before they suddenly realize that their intentions, uh, which should have been pretty obvious, were against the Saudi monarchy? Well, initially, uh, the people who, who funded them, and this is according to another American ally, uh, uh, Nouri al Maliki. Uh, the, 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 the ousted uh, leader of Iraq, it was Prince Bandar who funded uh, uh, elements of ISIL. Uh, so it was, you know, Bandar Bush, you know, it was the, it was the guy who, who had an open door with the Bush family uh, that, that, that initially dabbled with this in, in, in order to use them to counter Assad, and that was in the very first days. So at least we now have a united front then. Against a more united front against ISIS. You ha well, you you have slightly more serious and professional front against ISIS. Um, I think Naif's an interesting person to watch. He's m I think more pragmatic. I think people like Sisi and the United Arab Emirates must be feeling really frightened at the moment. But on the other hand, is that why the Iranians were there? Uh, because now there is a bigger yes. move in the region yes. against in them. Indeed, indeed. So I, I think you have a shifting of alliances going on. Um, uh, Egypt, there is a concern in Egypt simply because oh, they're so dependent uh, on the 20 billion dollars that they've received from Saudi Arabia and it's a bankrupt country so uh, and the Egyptian pound is, is, is going through the floor. So they're worried about whether Saudi is changing policy. All one needs in a sense to change the status quo is not for Saudi Arabia uh, to, to become less active but simply to become neutral in this affair and, 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 and less interventionist. And now what about the uh, revolutionary activity in the oil-rich east of the country? Very difficult for journalists to get access to it. What are the threats as regards a revolution against the Saudi monarchy, as we saw revolutions against other Western-backed dictators in the Arab world? It's always there. It's a question of how the monarchy absorbs it and a and, and question of how reformist it becomes. I mean, it's Shia, there's a, there's a, so, so, it's, so it's ethnically based. Um, but also, uh, they have traditionally been cut out of, of the royal cake, as indeed a lot, an awful lot of Sunnis have as well. I mean, there's a huge wealth imbalance going on in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and, and there's a permanent, low-level popular protest going on. Now, of late, uh, the, that protest has diminished. And I think some of them must have gone to Syria to fight with uh, uh, ISIL or the Islamic State. Um, but there is that permanent... Ooh, the people that were against the Shias in the East, you mean? Well, I'm talking about... The, oh, no, the people who are against the monarchy generally um, and, and who are Islamist and... So the Saudi against... government is facing a threat from both sides? From both sides, basically. yes. It basically has to, it basically has to liberalise. Now, Bin Naif could be the person to do that because he's Western educated and, I, and, and he's, as I say, I think he's an interesting man to watch. He's, he's, he's pragmatic. Um, but uh, the allegiances of who's against whom and why they did it, this is all very dirty stuff. And you only have to look at Yemen to see how an awful lot of these plots basically backfire. It was like a neocon operation by, by Abdulaziz that went badly wrong because uh, my information is that, that Bandai actually flew um, a, a Houthi politician to London and then to Riyadh to open contacts. This was, a, this was over a year ago. Um, and at the time I wrote this, everyone said, what? Why, why, what on earth are the Saudis doing backing the Houthis who are Iranian and they are Zaidi? Or backed by Iran. Oh, yeah, they're, 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 they're backed by Iran, they're not Iranian. Um, and they have links with Hezbollah, what are they doing? Uh, in the end, that proved to be true, that they, they were opening. And the, the idea behind that particular ploy uh, was to use them against Isla, who are, who are, who are the um, Islamists. Which oh, side is Britain them. on when it comes to what's happening in Yemen? I mean, there are the drone attacks that continue, but... Uh, the British-American alliance, are they supporting al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Are they supporting Isla or are they supporting the Houthis? Well, it's a very good question because they're, they're sitting on the sidelines. They're certainly trying to diminish the power of al-Qaeda. But what's happening with drone attacks, etc., with, with, with the Americans from, from Djibouti, but what's happening is that a Western ally in, in Saudi Arabia uh, caused, a, a, a caused a huge uh, uh, problem by by using the Houthis. So you had people basically saying death to the Jews and, uh, and, and Hezbollah trained who were protecting the American embassy. I mean, that's a very weird position to be in. So now you've Not got... Not that Hezbollah has ever expressed anti-Jewish feeling, I have to say. But let's just get on then to what on earth uh, we should do if Saudi Arabia 
with what may be a cataclysmic change in policy, who knows, start to ally itself with emerging economies and move away from Western armament sales that so many jobs I depend on? I think it would be a really good idea. It would be a really good idea if, if uh, not just Saudi Arabia but the whole of the Arab world moved away from its dependency on autocracy and Western arms. Yeah, how would you characterize uh, David Cameron's uh, uh, understanding of this situation? Though? Primitive, completely unprincipled, uh, um, waiting on the sidelines. David Hurst, thank you. Today, people all over London are marching to protest the nationwide housing crisis. From South London to East London, as well as across the country, ordinary people are fighting for affordable places to live, and the March for Homes is there to bring all the different groups together. To them, it looks like the government is more concerned with building new luxury developments, and it's all too impressed with foreign money paying for the gentrification of big cities. Of course, this isn't the first protest against soaring rents and lack of social housing. Only last month, the residents of the East London New Era housing estate marched to confront the US firms that plan to evict almost 100 families. And it does look like there is something to be angry about. According to a recent report by the London School of Economics, the coalition has not fulfilled its housing goals and is actually building fewer homes than the previous government. The report, written by Professor Becky Tunstall, has concluded that an average of 139,000 homes were completed between 2010 and 2013, compared to 570,000 homes built in the last three years of the Labour government. But according to David Cameron, the housing bubble is literally a laughing matter. Talk of a housing bubble to people here in Manchester or Salford, and they would literally laugh in your face. Really, Mr Cameron? One in 12 families are on a waiting list for social housing, according to the National Housing Federation. Supply is clearly not matching demand. Or is it? Take a look at this advert for flats in London, courtesy of estate agent Fraser & Co. Exclusive launch of 32, 1, 2 and 3 bedroom apartments. Fully private block with no social housing. No social housing? No wonder there's no social housing. That's it for today. Join us again on Monday. In the meantime, you can connect to us via Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud and email. And don't forget RTUK News with Bill Dodd every weekday evening on the hour from 6 till 10. See you on Monday. Welcome to Going Underground, I'm Afshin Ratansi. Coming up in the show, a resignation at the heart of Vince Cable's Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. We speak to Tessa Munt, who this week resigned from the government over fracking. And in the nine days since taking the throne, new Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz has overseen the beheading of more people than ISIS in the same period. Could he be the last king of oil-rich Saudi Arabia? Plus, Londoners march today all over the capital to protest against soaring rents, homelessness and the looming housing crisis. All this and more on today's Going Underground. <music> Syriza's victory in Greece is last week's news, with or without a bailout from China to secure its finances. Today, mass protests rage across Spain against the neoliberal troika of the IMF, the European Central Bank and the EU. Pollsters say the next Marxist party to win will be in Spain, Europe's fifth largest economy. After Podemos takes Madrid in December, it will be onwards, to Rome maybe. But if Spain and Italy follow Greece, what will Washington do? Last time Marxism spread across the continent, the USA did everything it could, from false flag attacks in Italy to backing Greek colonels to destroy the democratic movements sweeping post-war Europe. Mass media will be one powerful tool at Washington's disposal. Look at this on CNN after the victory of Syriza in Greece. There's been a lot of attention on this guy caught in Greece. Yes, CNN is talking about a terror suspect caught in Greece. The new Greek government has plenty of challenges ahead of it. A towering debt, chronic unemployment and relations with the rest of Europe. But it also has an urgent security problem. 
Greece has become an unwitting crossroads, both for jihadists trying to reach Iraq and Syria from Europe and for fighters returning home from the Middle East. Yes, forget that Washington and London have been supporting jihadists in Iraq and Syria for years. It's Athens that has the problem. Soon it'll be Madrid's and Rome's. Any place that doesn't bow down to the IMF, maybe. If Britain ever votes for an anti-austerity party, we will no doubt have to be targeted for becoming an unwitting crossroads for the jihadists of the Middle East. The bid to put a freeze on fracking was outvoted this week in Parliament by a majority of 308 to 52. The controversial shale drilling process has faced massive opposition from MPs and communities because of the impact on climate change. But David Cameron says Britain should go all out for shale. On Tuesday night, one of the opposing 52, Tessa Munt, Liberal Democrat MP for Wells in Somerset, resigned from her position as parliamentary aide to Business Secretary Vince Cable. She joins me now. Welcome, Tessa, to uh, Going Underground. So why did you resign? I resign because my position is clearly not compatible with the government's line on, on fracking. And um, having objected, I explained that I was going to continue to object to the process of fracking. And that's not compatible, so I did the right thing and resigned. And Vince Cables and Nick Clegg, they both agree with fracking. I don't know what their views are on the party policy, which is made by our members, is that we are in favour of fracking. Um, I disagree with my party policy on this and, you know, I can't make any apology for that. That's the way it is. I just think it's totally inappropriate for my part of the world. Do you think Vince Cable is coming under a lot of pressure from fossil fuel, the fossil fuel lobby, as it were? I mean, is that No, I don't think so. I think actually you'll find that the reality is that um, the Conservatives have said they've gone all out for fr fracking. My understanding is, I read some, some of the newspapers saying that there'd been a letter gone out to um, a number of ministers and to people within the government, um, I didn't have one, I have to say, um, saying that people should really work hard to make sure that Quadrilla and the companies who are doing this investigations work um, they should be supported in some way and that fracking should be brought into into play. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's where we stand pretty much. Because I mean, some voters yeah, might well, think, well, is... you know, we saw David Cameron, obviously, with the Huskies saying he's with, with green credentials. Liberal Democrats, often, before, certainly before the election, before the coalition government, green credentials. Isn't this just yet another, uh, well, yeah, there's... I'm it's a green, green coloured yes. emblem. Yes, absolutely. So, um, but I mean, I have to say, you know, the, you think the if Labour voters Party, will say why the Lib Dems, well, the Labour Party will be crowing well, about it, it was Labour, their amendment. They can crow about it, but they actually made a right horlicks of the whole thing on on uh, Monday night because, frankly, they they called the wrong amendment something that was going to be dealt with in devolution anyway. So they asked us all to go and vote on an amendment that was to do with Scotland completely pointless and that took away the ability of the House to be able to have time to discuss the trespass business which is actually that it is on that particular amend uh, that particular clause let's get on to that in a, se in a second yeah but the that's trespass. the thing that hangs on that's how the fracking debate came into monday at all it's only about the, the trespass clause okay but on, cl on climate, change, climate change more broadly it's absolutely the tories are for fracking the liberal democrats uh, uh, your leader vince cable the business yes. secretary he's for it the labor party two big unions that support it yes. unite and gmb seem to be for Yes. fracking so there is a broad one consensus hold one's own and you know i've tried over the last three years as pps events to make sure that i had access to people and try to change people's minds and to make them understand this is not the process that's being described you'll find all sorts of people in the house of commons saying look don't worry this has been going on for 30 40 years it's completely different this is, i've done my research my understanding is that this process was first started in 2008 in the usa the one time it's been done in the uk was when we had the incidents of minor earthquakes up near Blackpool. Um, this is a different process. It's high volume hydraulic fracturing. It's a new process. No one can tell me this has been tested and it's been executed in, in the past and we've been doing it for 40 years. This is utter tosh. So, you know, we've, we've really got to make sure that we, we close down and I, am, I cannot and could not support the government. That's why I voted for a moratorium and I'd hope to be able to vote for the other aspects. And I understand you have new information or information that may not be widely available because Lord Brown, the boss of Quadrilla, came on this program and said that drilling was legally uh, okay under people's homes without their permission. Nice for him. But I, right. but I understand that uh, well, this I has actually, implications yes. for lots I of people. I would take great exception to that because 
the, the where we are now, now that the you know the Conservatives and the Labour Party have actually pushed this bill through, the Labour, Labour lot by actually abstaining and not not calling a vote at the very end of it anyway, and not allowing trespass to be discussed, we now are in a situation where this bill allows for people's houses, farms, land, gardens, whatever, to be um, fracked underneath. So this you can have horizontal access to people's land at, at deep level. Now, the difficulty is, I discovered at the end of last week that actually one of the biggest insurers in my neck of the woods, which is NFU Mutual, that's the National Farmers Union, their insurance policy has an exclusion for anything that is caused as an impact of fracking. Now, that is a new clause and that is incredibly dangerous because, in my view, you have tenant farmers, you've got farmers, people who've got gardens, people who use the land for all sorts of purposes, anyone who's got a house on land. Um, if you can't insure yourself against something that the government says is going to happen without your permission, how on earth do you protect yourself? You know, homes and businesses are not going to have the protection. And once this one company's done this, and if you, I'm, I'm trying to find out whether the other insurance companies have taken the same view, but they've clearly assessed the risk. And in my area, you know, water is so important. Everybody knows about water in Somerset now, particularly as a result of the flooding, which took place in a relatively small geographical location, but with a massive impact on people's homes and lives last year and the year before. Now, if we've got a situation where water might be contaminated, then that is hugely risky for people who have animals on the land, who have crops on the land, who are market gardening on the land. And people need to be able to, it's just not fair to find that someone else can decree that something's going on underneath your land and you cannot protect yourself from the impacts of that action. This is, you know, we're used to insurances being around the idea of um, acts of God. This is an act of man and we should be able to allow people some protection. They have nothing now. And lots, and lots of money, but those arguments weren't enough to sway your Liberal Democrats. I didn't have a chance to colleagues. give them. I didn't have a chance to give them because of the way that the Labour Party called the various discussion of clauses and the votes, there was no opportunity for us to discuss in full the aspects of trespass and the appalling things that... Well, I thought the to. parliamentary fight was the fact that your colleagues were saying, actually, lots of these Labour amendments were in the bill. These protections are already There are in. some improvements. And part, I, you know, I was part of the, the, the process of, you know, I can see that I was going to be in a minority and I wouldn't be able to stop the bill. I didn't have the opportunity to try. But I wouldn't be able to stop the bill. You know, if you look at the numbers, you've got the Labour Party in favour, as you say, when GMB and Unite came winging in. And you've got the Conservative Party with Mr Osborne writing to people saying, look, go for it. The numbers are just too big, so who, who, there were only 52 of us in the end who actually went for the moratorium. There might have been more who would have voted to, to, against the bill. I don't know. We didn't have the opportunity to say that. But the fact is, we actually need to make sure that... Um, well, your leader thanked you and just said... I mean, that was the comment from the that's government. That's my work, I think, over... Over the last three but the, years, but the comment was there were safeguards. You just don't think the safeguards I don't think on the enough. current legislation. No, absolutely. Are good I mean, enough. I disagree with it on the grounds of climate change. Full stop. But since it's going to go forward, I negotiated as strongly as a, as a number of my other colleagues. I think there were thirteen or fourteen of us who were actually were negotiating for better regulation, better rules around all of this. But in the long run, if you're going to be beaten, you may as well try and improve what's left. There's no point in just throwing your toys out of the pram. So went for an improvement. We got that improvement. They accepted the Labour amendment um, because it does bring in some extra. It's, it's not worded the way I would want it, but I didn't have the choice about that. But Vince but it Cable, you was just not interested. I mean, did but you always know he was pro-fracking? I don't think he is necessarily pro-fracking. I, I, it's something you'd have to ask him about, but I don't, I'm not sure that you would say. I think the party policy and government policy is to be in favour of fracking. And I can understand some of the nuances about this, because if clearly we want to get rid of coal, and gas is better than coal, um, but in the long